And tonight we are being joined by Dr. Greg Skolmol from the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. Um, and tonight he's going to be talking to us all about white sharks, uh, which will be really nice, uh, really nice to see. Um, but before we launch into that uh, quick, the um, a few things about our partnership with Save Our Seas Foundation. So the Museum of Discovery and Science is the uh, host um, for all of our guests, uh, all of our distinguished speaker series. For the rest of the year, we're going to have one of these the first Thursday of every month. Um, most of them talk something about sharks or conservation biology or uh, education in ocean research and this kind of thing. Um, there is a special one on August 30th. That, that is International Whale Shark Day. So we're going to have a uh, whale shark scientist come and talk to us that day. So it's the first Thursday of every month. And... August 30th. <laughs> so if you're interested, you can sign up at mods.org and register and they can um, uh, join us. You can join us for all of the, the activities and all the fun. Um, so let me see here. Let's share this for a second. So the Museum of Discovery and Science, uh, like I said, is located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And um, our mission is to connect people to inspiring science. Um, we have four strategic action pillars that kind of guide everything that we do. Um, and they are as follows, in environmental sustainability, uh, physical science education, early childhood education, and health and wellness education. So our partnership with the Save Our Seas Foundation and the distinct, this uh, distinguished speaker series falls within that environmental sustainability uh, realm. And this is something that we are very much interested in creating a, a hub for environmental sustainability here in South Florida um, and a hub for resilience education as well. So uh, so this is kind of this kind of brings us to to this this partnership and how it came together. Um, a few little things about tonight. If you have any um, questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. We'll be getting to questions later in the, uh, rather in the broadcast. Um, the way this we're going to kind of go through so far, is I'll, I'll introduce Greg in a moment, and he's going to give you a, an overview of his research um, and show you some really awesome images of white sharks, which is, I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> and then we'll do a little question and answer um, as well, I have some questions lined up uh, for Dr. Skolmol, and um, uh, we'll open the floor up to you guys as well. So if you have questions, it doesn't matter when you have the questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'll be looking for them, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, before 7 o'clock. And if we have to go a little bit over, that's okay. No big deal. <laughs> so without further ado, Dr. Greg Skolmol, uh, he's an accomplished marine biologist uh, underwater explorer, photographer, and author. Uh, he's been a fishery scientist with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries since 1987, uh, and currently uh, heads up the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. He's also an adjunct faculty uh, at the University of Massachusetts School uh, for Marine Science and Technology, and an adjunct scientist at the world-renowned uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, he holds a master's degree from the University of Rhode Island and a PhD from Boston University. With more than 35 years, Dr. Skomo has been uh, actively involved in the study of life history, ecology, and physiology of sharks. Uh, his shark research has spanned the globe from the frigid waters of the Arctic Circle to the coral reefs and tropical Central Pacific. Uh, much of his current research centers on the use of acoustic telemetry and satellite-based tagging technology to study the ecology and behavior of sharks. So Dr. Skomo has uh, been an avid scuba diver and underwater photographer since 1987. Uh, he's written dozens of scientific research papers and has appeared in a number of film and, uh, film and television documentaries including programs for National Geographic, Discovery Channel, BBC, 
and numerous other, other television networks. His most recent book, The Shark Handbook, is a must buy for all shark enthusiasts. And I have to admit, I am a little bit um, starstruck a little bit when the first edition of the shark handbook I purchased <laughs> when I was in college. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, he's a Boston Sea Rover, a member of the Explorers Club. Uh, his home and laboratory are on the south coast of Massachusetts. So uh, Dr. Skolmel, thank you very much very much for joining us this evening. And uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Lance. I really appreciate that. It's, it's nice to be here. Um, I want to thank the museum for inviting me and of course, Save Our Seas Foundation, who has supported some of our research and research I will highlight tonight. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate that organization. They fund great research on a global scale um, and uh, it's all about sharks and, and rays, and, um, and I love it. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful organization, and, and so thank you. It's great. Thanks for coming out tonight, folks. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I will go ahead and uh, share my screen, and you just let me know, Lance, when I'm you, yeah, we got it. You got, we got it. Yeah, so I, I've, I've titled this Living with White Sharks, and um, I've been really fortunate over the long career that I've had to study a lot of different shark species, you know, all over the world. And um, a lot of my research has been focused on ecology, movement ecology, and physiology, natural history uh, on a variety of species. Uh, over the last... 10, 12 years, we've really been focusing a lot on great white sharks, specifically off the coast of Massachusetts. And up until then, you know, we, we were dabbling in white shark research, but most, most of what we know about white sharks in our part of the world, namely the Western North Atlantic, the East Coast of the United States and Canada, uh, has come from mostly dead specimens. So the, the first you know, slide I want to show you is um, a graphic that shows the distribution of the white shark based on historical records. And I like to I like to show this because there's a lot of talk about white sharks moving farther north because of climate change, but we have ample historical records. Each one of these little green dots represents uh, a white shark report. Uh, dating back to as early as the, the 18, early 1800s. Um, and we know that the white shark is, is largely restricted to the eastern Gulf of Mexico, but all along the eastern seaboard uh, up to Canada, as far as Newfoundland. And much of what we know uh, knew about the white shark uh, prior to um, our research, which started in a, roughly 2009, um, was really based on dead animals, you know, so each one of these little green dots was largely uh, a shark that had been reported to scientists, you know, through newspapers and as fishing reports, and they're mostly interactions with fishing gear. Um, and so you can see the general distribution, but it doesn't tell us much about the general biology or ecology, the movements, the behavior of these animals. Um, you really need to tag and study live specimens. But nonetheless, you know, over the course of my career, um, which is really focused in Massachusetts right now, and you could see that on the screen, the, my, my primary study area, um, I've had a chance to examine, you know, small dead white sharks right up to really big dead white sharks to pull tissue samples from them to look at various aspects of their natural history. So a good example of that might be we would look in the stomachs of white sharks to see what they eat. We would look at their backbones and count the rings on their vertebrae to determine their age, their growth rates, their longevity. But like I said, dead specimens don't tell you a lot about behavior. Um, but the phenomenon that changed things in the two, early 2000s was this resurgence of seals along the northeastern seaboard of the US. Um, protections that were put in place back in the early 70s, uh, namely the Marine Mammal Protection Act, allowed seal populations, which were really decimated 
and driven to the brink of extinction to slowly come back. And over the course of the last 50 years, seal populations off the northeastern coast of the US and Canada have rebounded. And here's a great example of that. This, this is a, a pile of gray seals uh, off the, uh, along the shoreline of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And when you've got this large, robust resource, you're going to draw predators. And, and really the only predator of seals in the Western North Atlantic, to our knowledge right now, is, is white sharks, great white sharks. And so white sharks are showing up in larger numbers closer to shore and, uh, and feeding on these seals, which is really a kind of a wonderful story in terms of ecosystem restoration, you know, conservation. You know, we're seeing more white sharks, we're seeing more seals, and we've got what's playing out here as a natural ecosystem. But it's come with some consequences because in the same areas where white sharks are feeding on seals in shallow water, which is what you're seeing right here, this is a white shark cruising very, very close to the shoreline along the eastern seaboard of Cape Cod, the, east, the outer Cape, as we typically refer it to it, um, we always get we also get overlap with humans. Okay, so Cape Cod has been established over the last hundred years as a, a, a popular tourist attraction where people are drawn to this area uh, because of its beautiful beaches, its wonderful shoreline, and a lot of you know ocean-oriented activities ranging from surfing to you know to windsurfing, you name it, uh, kayaking. And we've got this predator-prey relationship occurring in these shallow areas. And so what that has caused on a relative scale is an increase in what we call negative interactions between sharks and people, uh, typically referred to as shark attacks. And so our last fatal shark attack prior to recent years was in 1936. And this is a newspaper article from that year after that event. This is a local newspaper uh, based in Cape Cod. Uh, and you could see that it, it's reporting that a young man was killed by a shark in, uh, in, a, in an area referred to as Mattapoiset Cove. Um, that was in 1936 and that was right there, uh, which is actually not too far from where, where I live and where I'm sitting right now. Um, but over the course of the last decade, we have seen a relative increase in these interactions. You know? So for all those decades, there were no interactions between white sharks and people. Uh, but with white sharks being drawn closer to shore, we had a, a swimmer bitten in 2012. It was not a fatal injury. We had kayakers whose kayak was bitten by a white shark in 2014. We had a paddleboarder uh, where the paddleboard was bitten in 2017. We had a swimmer that was bitten in 2018. Again, not fatal, but just a month later in September of 2018, we had a bodyboarder, a boogie boarder bitten and killed by a white shark. So normally up until now, most of my research is really focused on the general biology, ecology of these animals, physiology, what makes them tick, how they work, all to try to aid conservation but we dramatically shifted after that fatal attack in 2018 to try to focus on producing information that would enhance public safety. And so we proposed a, a study that would look specifically at white shark behavior. And unfortunately for us, Save Our Seas Foundation stepped up and funded a couple of years of this research. Um, and really the question is, and, and scientists, always are just asking questions. And then we, we use all kinds of methods to try to answer those questions. And we hope we can answer them in a way that is valid and, and statistically sound. So our question here, here is, is, if we really boil it down, is where, when, and how do white sharks feed on seals in this area? And, our, and, the, and the reason we're asking this question is we're hoping to collect information and observe this behavior directly and indirectly to look for patterns and how those patterns might be correlated with environmental factors. So a good example of that might be, you know, do white sharks feed on seals during the day or at night? High tide versus low tide. Does water temperature play a role? Does depth play a role? 
You know, so we're trying to observe behavior and find these patterns as it relates to those factors. And if we think that if we find patterns, we can then predict what might likely happen given those conditions so we could forecast. And we think by forecasting where white sharks are most likely to be feeding on seals, we could share that with the general public to try to enhance public safety. So that's how we're translating understanding this behavior into information that will enhance public safety. So if I tell you as a swimmer on Cape Cod, and I'm being purely hypothetical here, that white sharks feed on seals you know, at night, well, then you probably feel safer during the day than at night, right? So that's an example of how we can produce information to enhance public safety. Um, and so what are the methods we're using? So we know our question, what are the methods? And so I go into a bunch of different methods here where we're using acoustic telemetry, in a, in a, in a, in a, and I'll go into this in great, great detail, where we're setting up an array of acoustic receivers, we're using live receivers, and we're using uh, fine scale arrays. Um, we're using satellite-based technology tags that will transmit to satellites information that will help us understand the behavior of these animals. And we're using newer technologies like behavior tags that have cameras in them. And then we're also using drone technology, which as all of you know, has really taken off over the course of the last decade or so, um, where we can observe the behavior of these animals um, in real time and see what they're doing. Uh, tonight, because of time constraints, I'm gonna really focus just on acoustic telemetry and behavior tags. And I've laid this talk out just to answer basic questions, you know? So I wanna translate what we do as scientists into information that you guys will understand and can digest and can generate questions of your own. Um, so let's dive into that. You know, our tagging technique is, is pretty straightforward, but it's also fairly unusual compared to other parts of the world. Um, for other studies, I might use chum to draw sharks to a boat. I might capture them. I might put, bring them up to the side of the boat and tag them. I might tag them while they're swimming around the boat after I've drawn them with chum. But what we do is because we're working so close to shore and so close to really popular swimming beaches, we're trying to use the least invasive technique possible. We don't wanna capture these animals, drag them through the water, use big, big hooks. We don't wanna do any of that stuff because that could modify their behavior. And we don't wanna do that in any way close to the public. And so what we use is a plane, which you see pictured here, uh, and that plane has a pilot. That pilot's name is Wayne Davis. He's also a phenomenal photographer. So many of the photos I'll show you tonight are photos, including this one taken by Wayne. And we use a, a, a small boat that moves very quickly through the water. Plane spots a shark. We will then approach that shark. And you see me out on the end of the long pulpit on a boat. And that's so we can get ahead of the boat, not spook the shark with the boat, and I can place a tag using a small intramuscular dart into the base of the dorsal fin. So again, we're trying to minimize you know, uh, any kind of invasive tagging techniques here. The one thing we don't wanna do is study natural behavior, but alter that behavior during the tagging process. And so here you see a white shark that I've just tagged from the pulpit of this boat. Um, what I'll show you now is an actual video of the tagging technique. And you'll see me here, on the end of the pulpit, you'll see my long tagging pole. The tag itself is at the end of the pole. There's a small needle and a small dart that I'm gonna place just under the skin at the base of the dorsal fin. And hopefully, Lance, let me know, give me a thumbs up if this is playing okay. Um, you'll see this shark just swimming along and I place the dart and that's just gonna resume its behavior. And that's the technique. You know, I'll show you guys that again, just so you can see. Um, how, how simple it is and how, you know, working with the plane, working with the captain, we're able to get these tags out. And in that case, we placed an acoustic transmitter. We're going to talk about that acoustic technology now. Um, so this graphic here shows our various kinds of tags, right? We have the acoustic tags, which I'll talk about shortly. The satellite technology, which I will not discuss tonight, but think of the satellite technology giving me great information about the broad scale movements of these animals. Where do they go when they leave Cape Cod? Um, and then these behavior tags, which I'll focus on shortly. Um, what you see on the right side of the screen 
is a graphic that shows everywhere we've seen white sharks along the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all right? And you'll see most of these observations are from the northern tip, an area known as Provincetown, Mass, all along the eastern seaboard out to the southern tip, which is Monomoy Island, okay? So you'd be hard pressed when people ask me all the time, where do you see white sharks? I'd say you'd be hard pressed. The better question might be is where do we don't see white sharks? Um, this is an area known as Cape Cod Bay. Cape Cod Bay is an area that does have white sharks, but we have only been in there a couple of times to tag white sharks. And you can see where we have seen the sharks during that period. Now, does this map reflect everywhere that white sharks go in Massachusetts? And the answer to that is quite simple. No, it does not. And to, to, to determine that, we place acoustic receivers around Massachusetts so that we don't necessarily have to go everywhere to determine where they go. We use technology to answer that question. So this is how an acoustic tag works. Um, it is a small tag you place on the shark that emits a very high frequency sound. That sound is picked up by an array of acoustic receivers. You could see the receiver on the, less, the, re the left hand side of your screen. This, this receiver is only about a foot long. It's, uh, it's about three inches in diameter and we place it out in the water. Um, anytime the shark swims within the detection range of that receiver, the receiver will de determine, pick up that sound, determine who that shark is, because each one of these tags is individually coded and it'll do a date stamp and time stamp. So we get the date, the time and who that shark is. And then we place these receivers all around Massachusetts to determine where these sharks spend their time, when they arrive, when they leave, so we can determine seasonality. So here's a um, really neat graphic that shows all of our acoustic receivers, which are the little yellow dots, some hypothetically tagged sharks emitting these high frequency sounds that are picked up by these receivers along the coast of Cape Cod. And then we go back and we pull these receivers and we download the data from them to determine where are the hot spots. You know, when do they arrive, when do they leave, and where are the hot spots? And that's the way the technology works. It's fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. But now we're going to try to answer some of these really basic questions that you guys might have that we have as scientists. You know, if I'm a swimmer on Cape Cod, my first question might be, when do the white sharks show up? When are they here? You know, are they here all the time? Are they here during just the summer? When are they here? So all we really have to do is look at all our acoustic detections from those receivers and plot them out by month. And this is the seasonality of white sharks around Massachusetts. They really don't show up in big numbers until July, you know, and that's not even our greatest number of detections. Our peak months are August, September, and October. So if I'm somebody coming to Cape Cod to surf in the summertime, I'm gonna kind of bum out and say, all right, here we go. The months that I want to be there are the same months that the white sharks are there. But let's say I'm a winter surfer, and I, a lot, I know a lot of folks who surf during the winter because the surf tends to be a little bit better or can be a little bit better. And so those folks don't have to deal at all with the presence of white sharks. So we've already determined the seasonality, right? So you are, you're out here on the beaches of Cape Cod, you know, for the most part, May, June, um, and then in the off-season months, not that many people are swimming or doing much out there in those off-season months, you know, those are months that the sharks are not here. So if I'm managing beaches, I know I have a sense of peak white shark activity around Cape Cod. And then the next question is, okay, well, where are they in Massachusetts? Are they all over the Cape? Are they, you know, off Boston? Where, where do they spend their time? So now all we have to really do is plot out our receivers and plot out where these sharks are spending their time by simply uh, what you've seen me do here is this is a bubble graph. So I've made the size of my receivers proportional to the number of sharks that are actually detected on those receivers over the course of those summer months. So the smaller the dot, the fewer white sharks that go there. So if we look at this body of water on the left side, that's Buzzards Bay, very few white sharks, if none, go there. Nantucket Sound, which is this other body of water just east of there, very few white sharks. But where do they go? They go along this eastern seaboard, again, where we had seen most of our sharks during our research, all the way from Provincetown to the north, 
down to Monomoy Island. That's where we get 60, 70 of our sharks over the course of the summer that had been tagged, spending their time. So this demonstrates residency as well. As we start to move off to the west, we can see the numbers start to drop off. And then as we go north all the way up to Boston, the numbers really drop off. So if I'm managing a beach south of Boston, let's say off of uh, um, Situate or Marshfield or Plymouth, any of these towns, you can see that the risk of sharks being there is extremely low compared to these outer Cape towns like Wellfleet, Provincetown, East Ham, Chatham. That's where the bulk of the sharks are spending their time. So if we take these two questions and combine them, and I animate that, I'm gonna show you this uh, graphic that shows the movements, the actual movements of our tagged white sharks into Cape Cod back in 2019, a few years ago, all right? In the upper left-hand corner, what you see is the date. This is uh, June 2nd. We'll march right through the seasonality of white sharks moving in. And each one of these little white dots is our acoustic receiver. The number of detections will cause those receivers to bump up. So the bigger those dots, the more white sharks are there, just like the previous graphic. But now you can look at the movement of white sharks through Massachusetts waters as we uh, went through the season of 2019. And you'll see every now and then one of these dots explode. And that means the white sharks are spending a little bit of time there, but then they, you'll see them shrink. And that'll pulse through as these animals move up into the Gulf of Maine along the, the, uh, the Eastern shoreline, just South of Boston. But then you'll see always a dominant bubbles as we uh, are again along the eastern seaboard of Massachusetts uh, and Cape Cod. You know, that outer Cape area is really where they want to be. And, and, the, and, the, and the answer as to why they're there is really fairly straightforward. This is where the greatest numbers of seals occur. There'll be people in the water all along the coastline of Massachusetts, but the sharks don't want people, okay? They don't want people. They want to eat seals. And so they're moving to these areas where there are high densities of seals. And, the, you know, I talk about shark attack, but the truth is, from a statistical point of view, the probability is extremely low. So I know people that surf the Outer Cape every day through the summer and don't worry about shark attack because they know that probability is very, very low. People have asked me, well, it's great, Greg. These data are wonderful but you collect them at the end of the season. How does that really help people in the near time, real time? And so what we've also done is we've, we've uh, been purchasing these receivers that will transmit detections of a shark to lifeguards on the beach in real time. So this is a public safety tool that anytime one of our white sharks swims, and this is a very good example. Um, here's a beach, you can see a lifeguard stand on the beach. This, this receiver here will pick up that white shark detection and literally text that lifeguard saying, right now you've got a white shark, you know, named Chex or named Salty or James or whoever right in your swimming area. And that those people on the beach will then be able to uh, decide what they want to do in terms of uh, managing their swimmers and, and others who are conducting on the water or in the water activities. So that's a nice tool. The, the reason I don't have a hundred of these receivers is because they're roughly $15,000 each. And, uh, and that comes at a great expense. Um, so these acoustic detection data are really great in terms of telling us what these sharks are doing in terms of hot spots, arrivals, departures, seasonality, you know, um, but the more difficult question for us to answer and, and is how do they go about hunting these seals? We're getting the when, we're getting the where, but how do they hunt these seals? And, and that's, that's a bit challenging because we could be on the water every day. Um, we might be on the water for eight, 10 hours a day, but we might not see white sharks kill seals. Sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. And if we're there at night, we're not going to see a darn thing, you know, so that's, that's one of the problems we have. We can't be there all the time. Um, and to observe that behavior, sometimes we are. You know, here's a, 
Here's a great photograph of a white shark that had just killed a gray seal off of uh, a swimming beach in Cape Cod. Uh, and I'll show you some footage that we took that day, which shows the white shark eating the seal, all right? It kills the seal very quickly, all right? So there's, it's not let, and, and I will tell you this, the seals will fight back if they're, you know, if they're not killed immediately. And so what happens is you'll see these sharks that have scars and scratches and bite marks from the seals on them. What's really amazing about white sharks is when they're small, when they're young, up to about seven, eight, nine feet long, they feed almost exclusively on fish. But as they go through what I call their white shark puberty, they start to really beef up and bulk up like humans do. You know, their muscles get bigger, but their jaws get bigger as well. And their teeth shape changes from a sharply pointed tooth to a cutting tool, a perfectly serrated cutting tool, a triangular tooth. And so they shift their diet to some extent and they add seals and other marine mammals to their diet. And what you'll see this white shark doing is trying to rip off that rich, thick blubber layer that seals have. And that's what they're targeting. They want that fatty blubber, which will sustain a shark for a considerable period of time. And so by attacking and killing and eating seals, which they naturally do, they are cap they, they, it's, it's a much better, more energetically efficient way for them to feed. But how do we study this behavior when we can't see it? You know, we can't be on that boat 24 hours a day trying to find white sharks feeding a sea on seals to determine when those periods of time are that they're doing that, what are the, what's the water temperature, what's the depth, what's the current doing, what's the tide doing. All that information is important. When we see a, an event like I just showed you, we record that information. But what happens when we're not there? You know, I have to go home. I have a life. I can't be out there 24 hours a day. And at night, like I said, we can't see anything. And that's where these data logging behavior tags come in. You know, it's the latest, greatest technology. A lot of researchers are using it to study the behavior of animals at finer scales. And so I'll spend a little bit of time right now finishing up my talk, talking about how we collect information, how we collect observations when we can't be there. And that's using this camera technology. So what you see here, again, the pulpit of our boat, but this is a white shark that's pulling one of these behavioral camera tags. And this is a close-up of that tag. The first thing you're gonna see on this shark at the base of its dorsal fin is one of my standard acoustic tags. But you'll also see this small link just beyond that. And that link is a galvanic link. And all that means is that shark, this tag will detach after a period of two to four days, depending on what we want, um, and float to the surface. Inside the tag itself, is a camera system in addition to, to a lighting system, as well as satellite based tags so that we can pick it up. But most importantly, there's a bunch of sensors in this tag that tell us what the shark is doing every second. Is it swimming left, right? Is it accelerating? Is it slowing down? Is it swimming up, down? Where is it in the water column? You know, what is its depth in the water column? What is its water temperature? So it's collecting all this amazing information, which we want to try to correlate with the behavior of the shark, right? Um, every second. As a matter of fact, it's doing it 10 times a second. So this generates amazing behavioral data that I will short, show you very shortly. And I'm going to give you an example of how we can study the behavior of the shark without being there. All right, so here's one of our sharks. Again, a great photo by my uh, friend, Wayne Davis. And it's swimming off this, this small group of seals. And then the seals aren't stupid. So whenever you think about a predator-prey relationship, think in terms of a, a sophisticated game of cat and mouse, all right? The cat wants to get the mouse, but the mouse really doesn't want to be gotten, all right? It's not in the interest of these seals to be eaten by a shark. <laughs> and the shark, of course, wants to eat the seals. The seals are pretty smart. So they're going to stay in this really shallow water right here where they know the shark can't get to them. But the shark's gonna to continue to patrol out here, waiting for one of these seals to basically screw up. 
And if it doesn't screw up, or if it gets a little bit into deeper water, the shark's gonna go for it. You'll also see on the back of this shark, one of our camera tags. So this shark we were observing from a boat, but also from the air that day. And it gives us a great example of, of how these tags uh, would be, you know, show us what the shark is doing if we were not there. All right, so this shark eventually seemingly gets frustrated and makes a rush toward the beach at one of these seals. And this is the shark actually attempting to attack and kill this seal uh, very, very close to where these waves are breaking in extremely shallow water. Um, now I'm gonna show you what the camera recorded, not only um, from the camera's perspective, but also the sensors that are built into this tag. Now, this is Cape Cod, this is not Florida. We don't have really crystal clear water here. But here we are riding the back of this white shark as it attempted to go after this seal. And what you're gonna see is this shark just cruising along very, very slowly, but when it accelerates toward the seal, it's going, the, the camera's gonna go berserk because it's a towed, tethered camera tag, which means that when this shark accelerates right here, you're gonna see the camera go fly from side to side. And this shark is now in hot pursuit of this seal right up into the shallows where the surf is breaking. For those of you who are rooting for the seal, I, I don't know if it's playing okay still, Lance. Is it still going? You hear it me? Is, yes, it is still going, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, for those rooting for the seal, you, you win. Um, <laughs> this shark missed the seal, okay? Um, and now it's gonna go back out into deep water and we're gonna go through that video footage frame by frame and see what we can see. And so this is a particular frame right before the shark encountered the seal. And if you look very closely, you'll see this dark patch. That's actually the seal getting away from the shark. So this is a predatory event. Um, it's a failed predatory event. But let's look at the data from the tag. Now, what, what, what if we were, what if the camera stopped running? You know, what does this look like in terms of the data collected by the tag. So I'm gonna bore you with this one slide um, that shows data. Uh, and what you'll see in the top is the depth of the shark. Or, and you can see the tag is on the boat, right? So I put the, the tag on the shark at 1220, right? And when I put it on the shark, the shark's gonna accelerate because I spook it and I'm placing a tag on the shark. And you can see it accelerates in three planes. What you, each one of these graphs shows acceleration forward, side to side, and up and down. So whenever you accelerate, you know, and you're moving, you know, in multiple dimensions, which is what the ocean is, because sharks can go up, down, right, and left, um, and forward, they, you will see acceleration in three planes. And that's all that shows. But here you see two other acceleration events right here where the shark moved into shallow water we think attempting to attack and kill a seal, which is what we actually just visualized. And here you could see accelerations when the sharks are doing that. So we get a sense of the shark speeding up, moving into shallow water, and then moving back out into deep water um, after it attempts to feed. So this is what those events look like. So we can look at feeding frequency and see when that's happening relative to water depth and against those aspects of time of day, et cetera, et cetera. And we can actually recreate what the shark did when it attempted by looking at these various data sets that coming from the sensors in the tag, we can look at what that shark did in three dimensional space when it attempted to go up and attack and kill the seal. And in this case, of course, as we know from the event itself, the shark missed and moved out back into deep water. So that's how we take data from the tag. We're not there and use it to determine the behavior of this animal. And that's technology that really didn't exist more than a decade ago. Um, so with that, I'm going to entertain a lot of questions. Um, stay tuned for the results as they come in. We've been using this technology again 
thanks to the Save Our Seas Foundation for the last two summers. We've deployed it on uh, 25 different white sharks over the course of those summers, and we're starting to pull patterns out of those data sets. If you are interested in our research and you want to learn more, but also see data coming from these tags, go to the AtlanticWhiteShark.org website of the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. You'll see our white shark logbook. You'll see our white shark catalog of all the sharks we've identified, which numbers over 500 off the coast of Cape Cod. You can download the Sharktivity app to see where white sharks are being reported, not only in Cape Cod, but elsewhere throughout the Gulf of Maine, all the way down to Florida, um, where our sharks have been detected, where our satellite tags go. Um, and so you could stay with us and follow along what we're doing and, um, and even learn and, and ask, ask and answer your own questions. So I want to thank a whole bunch of people, including the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, which has funded quite a bit of our research, all the boat and all those kinds of things, as well as Save Our Seas and others. And if you want to learn more about uh, our work um, and sharks in general, uh, Lance mentioned the Shark Handbook, but the third edition just came out um, last year. And, uh, and Cy Montgomery wrote, wrote a wonderful book that highlights our research called The Great White Shark Scientist. It's great for kids. It's got lots of wonderful photos by Keith Ellen Bogan. So with that, Lance, I will turn it back to you. If that's something I need to do. Yeah, option. thank you very much. This is all really, I can listen to you talk more in detail. I want to know more about the satellite tags too, but um, maybe they can, so if anyone is more interested, they could go um, to, to your uh, websites and, and figure out uh, and find more information, right? Oh yeah, um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for for that. Um, I have a lot of questions, and I know that um, our our audience has a few as well. So we'll just dive right in. If you will excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> so I, I know that a lot of your the, well, a lot of this research. Oh, would you mind um, not sharing the screen? You're you're in control of that. If you don't mind, there we go. Thank you. There we go. Um, so I know a lot of your research is fueled, if you will, by um, the want for public safety, right? Um, we've all seen the backlash against shark attacks or heard about it. Um, I mean, it's kind of immortalized in the, the Jaws movie, right? Um, to go hunt and find and remove it, right? To put it lightly. Um, so it's it's I think it's heartening for me to to hear that we're taking a more scientific approach, right? It's actually thinking about the problem in a scientific way, answering questions. That way we act on the best information that we have available to us, right? So that's, that's a really important thing. And I really like those, those real-time detectors. That is, that's really neat because I know a lot of times you've seen in beaches around the world, you'll see shark nets put up and that poses all kinds of dangers and all kinds of issues with the sharks themselves, um, running into them and getting tangled in them. Um, so this is a, a different solution to, to let them have their space, but then also, you know, alert the, alert the lifeguards, which I think is really, really interesting. Mm. So going with that kind of public safety mindset, you know, you showed us the hot, the hot zone, the hot spot mapping uh, according to the acoustic tags. So has there been any efforts to, to make those maps into like more, more of a public um, thing? You put, put it on the beaches and this kind of thing, or is that more like a next step uh, coming out of the research? Yeah, what we've, the, the, the sli one of the last slides I showed were resources and right. you, can, you can actually see detections um, at the in our uh, at the Atlantic White Shark website, uh, AtlanticWhiteShark.org, um, we show it shows the detections of all our sharks each mm -hmm. year, and then individual sharks each year as well. So that's a resource that's available to the public if they want to investigate. You know who's who's spending their time where. Right. Uh, we and also the app as well, right? People can log in. Could, the yeah. map's right there. Yeah, it's a map. Um, yeah. Sharktivity will show that as well. And then also um, we have signage at every beach that shows detection frequencies just to give the, the swimmers and the surfers 
the boogie boarders, you name it, a sense of the presence of these animals based on our data. Um, so much of what you saw tonight is provided to the public. Um, the next steps for us, and this is a study we just completed, is to start generating daily maps with probabilities of sharks. And that is probably going to start this summer where we post maps that based on various environmental conditions like water temperature, we'll be able to say where the likelihood of sharks are to, where most, where, where, shark, where white sharks are most likely to be that given day, all right? So again, we're, we're trying to use the science like you just said to answer critical questions that will enhance public safety and then generate products that the public can go to and easily understand and say, okay, this is where the sharks are spending their time, you know? Right. That's, that's, not that's easy good. To do. That's good. Not easy to do. And it's not made, you know, if it was easy to do, other, other places would be doing, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and you, you talk, I think you addressed it in the very beginning, but like in Florida, for example, we have lots of different species of shark. And I'm sure that's the same case for Cape Cod, but you said at the beginning, most of the activity and the human interaction comes from seal populations, right? So white sharks are the primary, uh, uh, you know, predation of, uh, of the seals. So I guess you can have a more, more control over what you're looking at and looking at white sharks exclusively. And that gives you a good amount of information, right? How, how, uh, well, I guess how complete <laughs> is, do you, do you estimate your uh, tagging network to be? You, know, you mentioned 282 sharks. Is that a pretty complete representation of what the white shark population is in the Cape Cod area at that time of year and in, in, during the summer? It, I, I mean, I think it's a very good start. Um, the, uh, and, and, and quite possibly more than that, the, um, you know, I've got a student right now, and this is this is breaking news that's going to happen in the next month or so. Um, she's been doing a bunch of uh, very quantitative modeling to give an estimate of the white shark population, and therefore, therefore, the proportion which we have tagged. You know, I don't have those results yet, so I apologize. But okay. um, it's something we're actively working on. You know, but but with three hundred close to three hundred sharks tagged, that's very good. Um, you know, the, a lot of these animals come back every year and, uh, we're also tagging off North Carolina, South Carolina, New York. Um, so we're trying to beef that up to make sure we're not missing some segment of the population and we'll likely be tagging in Canada this summer as well. So there's, um, you know, we, we're spreading our effort, effort out, but, you know, you always wonder, you know, when is enough enough? You know, from, from a scientific perspective, you want to have a significant sample size. And so we're, I think we're getting there, but, uh, you know, we we'll keep plugging away. Right. Yeah. That's always, that's always the problem. Sample size, right? Always. <laughs> yeah. Always. So with the, with the white shark populations rebounding with, with the seal populations, have, have there been any, has there been much research to, to see like our seal populations at at carrying capacity for the for for the Cape, or is there still room for the seal population to grow? It, it's a great question, and one we don't know yet. We don't know the right. answer to. Um, yeah. I think I, I think every seal biologist be, uh, up here would be hard pressed to answer that. Um, you know, it's it's starting to plateau, but um, we 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 have to you know, we have to see. It's been a, it's been great growth over the last you know, two decades in particular. Right. And so we, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, because it could, it could mean more, I guess, more white sharks as the population goes up potentially over time, but which I think is a great thing, but it's, <laughs> it's a conservation win. <laughs> um, great. Just another question for about the tags. How, how long do the tags, the acoustic tags, how long will they stay on? Do you have to re-tag the shark every season or will the, will the acoustic no, no, tags we stay on? We use it, you know, we use that external tagging technique and we, but we've had great success. T typically external tags might last a year or two, but you know, our technique results in up to uh, at this stage, up to six or seven years of data. Um, those tags will ping up to 10 years. 
So if we can keep them on, we'll get 10 years of data on an individual fish, which is absolutely uh, amazing when you compare it to you know, what I was doing back in college uh, 100 years ago. <laughs> Nice. That's that, that's good. It kind of makes you don't have to you don't have to redo the work every season, right? When you go. Oh yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to do that to a shark multiple multiple times. Right. Yeah. Well, that's cool. That's good. Um, so, well, you you speak about your your past, and I one of the things I want to do in, in these talks is get to know the scientists a little more. And you know, if we have a a potential scientist shark biologist out there in the audience right now, um, Ted, can you? Tell us what what was your journey to to where you are now? What got you interested in sharks and white sharks in particular? Well, I well, you know, I, I've, I've studied dozens of species of sharks. And so, you know, white sharks is is kind of the holy grail of sharks that most most shark biologists want to eventually do something with. But, um, I, you know, I, I, I was, you know, the, the short answer to that is, you know, I, I, I a lot of kids are fascinated by sharks and dinosaurs and I, and other charismatic metagafauna like dolphins and whales. And I just never outgrew that, you know, and <laughs> that, I love that answer. That's so good. <laughs> that's kind of how it works the, the kid inside alive, right? <laughs> uh, ask anyone that goes on a boat with me. I'm a little bit um, childish. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> That's why I say it here at, here at the Museum of Discovery and Science, we it's for children age zero to 99 plus, right? <laughs> I fit in well there. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, so we had a few questions from the audience before we finish out with, with uh, some final questions from me. Um, so we had a question from, uh, from Haley in the audience. Uh, Haley asked, um, has there been any long-term studies or projections on what effects the changing climate or water temperature will have on seal populations and in turn on white shark populations? Do you foresee any significant effect um, to their location telemetry? So it's kind of looking at climate change, right? As the oceans warm, um, how will that affect these populations? No, it's a, I love the question because it, my favorite questions are the ones without answers. Um, the uh, <laughs> No one's taken a really hard look at it because it's um, it's a tough question to, to answer. Um, what I can say, I'll start with white sharks. Uh, I'm not a seal biologist, but I've, I, I've played one on TV. The, um, the, the white sharks in general, you know, are incredibly tolerant of a very broad temperature range, you know, so they, they move down. And if I showed satellite data, you'd see this, you know, they move down off the southeastern U.S. where they spend the winter. As far as the Gulf of Mexico, all the way up to, um, you know, um, the, the throughout Florida waters. So you'll see white sharks there. They're tolerant of an incredibly broad temperature range. And I don't see climate change really impacting or changing their distribution um, directly. I think it's more of an indirect impact in terms of what happens with seals. And for that, I don't have a good answer um, because um, in, I guess, I guess I would say that seals are wearing fur coats with thick blubber. And so they have, they can't tolerate tropical weather. And so I would imagine seal populations might shift north. And of course, there's a seasonal change in seals populations like white shark populations, they expand and contract. This time of year, they could be as far south as, you know, North Carolina, you know, Virginia. And then as water temperatures warm up, in the spring into the summer, those seals will return to New England, uh, where, the, where they'll be restricted to anywhere from the eastern end of Long Island all the way up to Canada. So we know that temperature impacts their movements. So as, as we see the Gulf of Maine warm, as we see you know, parts of this, the southern New England warm as they are, I can imagine that seal populations will have to shift or the distribution will shift you know, north. Um, and that, of course, might change what white sharks do because they're focused on, I want to eat a seal, right? Mm -hmm. So I can tolerate water temperatures that are up into the 70s, and I can tolerate water temperatures down into the 40s, right? But right. I want to eat a seal, so I'm just going to follow that, you know, but I love right. the question. 
So, so you might be doing your research in Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might be. Yeah, we actually are going to be this this summer for a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And when you think about white sharks as the top predator of their ecosystem, there are other issues that arise. You know, plastic pollution and microplastics working in their way up the food chain, um, and what impact could that have on white sharks? And I, I know you're, that's not your spe speciality, but that these are other questions we have with other top well, predators. A, you know, that's the a tough one. of plastic pollution and this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one because um, to really look at that, you need to have animals that may have suffered from that. And mm -hmm. so those are typically dead, right? So yeah. we don't have a lot of dead white sharks and we're not it's allowed to thing. legally kill them. <laughs> which is a fine thing. I'm fine with that. Yeah. So much of that early, those little green dots I showed in my first slide, which are mostly dead sharks, that's fortunately stopped to a certain extent. They're still killed as bycatch. You know, they're still wrapped up in nets and, and they're caught in fisheries. The fishermen have to let them go, but they might be dead. Right. Right. Well, hopefully we can enact more policies and, and more, more regulations to help with that, with the bycatch issues and things like this. We have, we have a few more speakers later in the series that, are, that will be talking about that mm -hmm. exact thing with recreational fishing and commercial fishing and this kind of thing too. So stay, if you're a viewer, stay tuned for, for future um, talks about bycatch and, and this kind of thing and how it impacts shark populations. Um, and you kind of answered the next question we had from a guest already, but um, they were asking where the sharks primarily go during the winter months. And we can, you have that data with, with the satellite tags, I assume, right? Oh, yeah. We, we, we published a, a paper on that, and we have another one coming out very shortly where we look at the broad-scale movements of white sharks in the Atlantic. Um, what they do is th think of the population as expanding and contracting, like I said. Um, the, it contracts down to you know, the southeastern U.S. and the Gulf of Mexico in the winter, you know, anywhere from, say, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, south. Um, and then it expands in the summer, you know, up to New England, as far north as Canada. And, and it's very, you know, typical seasonal migration. We've seen a lot of fish species. You know, our water temperatures out here uh, in the wintertime, not many species of fish, not, not a lot of marine animals can tolerate that. So the movement of turtles, and and sharks and and many species of fishes you know is timed seasonally you know right. whales whales are here now they're starting to arrive early they have the capacity to tolerate cold water um but most of those other cold-blooded uh, animals will follow as temperatures warm up right yeah we we commonly have white sharks here in the in the summertime i i know you can you can go to any one of those white shark tracking <laughs> websites and make, yours is one of them probably. So That's you can right. see where they're going. And I, I've, I've had the fortune to actually see one um, on a reef actually in, in the Keys, which was really amazing. Just seeing it very slowly and very calmly just cruise by and it didn't stop. It didn't think about anything. It didn't think about us. That's for sure. It just kept going. Right. And well, that's uh, great. You always wonder like, where are you heading? You know, like there, there are no major fat seals down here. It's just, it's no, just they, a, there's a lot to figure out there. where they're going and where they're, where do they mate? Where do they, what do they do down here? Right. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. So, um, We'll end with a few other questions. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions in the chat, please feel free to, to post them there. Um, but we'll kind of end with, and I think I kind of have some ideas of what you might say to this, but you know, if where do you see this project expanding to? What, what is your, your wish list, if you will, for this project? You know, if you were offered a, a blank check and said, do what you will with this project, what, what would you do? Well, you know, we'd probably follow course on what we're currently doing. You know, the technology is evolving very quickly. You know, when you go, you know, now I'm aging myself, but when I was at the University of Rhode Island for my undergraduate, you know, the, 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 these things didn't exist, right? They, they oh, didn't, yeah, the cell phones, yeah. They didn't exist. <laughs> Smartphones. Not only did those things not exist, but personal computers didn't exist, all right? You know, we used big mainframe computers on campus that were 
less powerful than this thing. All right. Mm -hmm. So we've been able now to go from using very little technology on sharks to putting camera systems on sharks. And that's, that's amazing over a, you know, a 30 to 40 year span. Um, and the technology is just going to keep getting better. You know, so if I, I think if somebody gave me a blank check, I'd probably sit down with some of the, the more creative engineering companies and high tech companies to think of what's the next greatest technology. You know, um, how do I put a camera on a shark and not have to get it back in two days? You know, what's it going to take for a satellite to transmit images back to us, you know, in the capacity that would allow us to, to not have to retrieve it, to do, to do long-term tracking, right? And so I've always been excited about uh, technology and I'm not an engineer, and, but I'll tell you for, for folks who are interested as young scientists, you don't have to become a marine biologist. I hire, you know, I work with all kinds of people from the person who flies a plane, who drives a boat, who builds the boat, right? Who builds the tower. Yeah. To to folks who are designing tags and making them better. You know, we use underwater vehicles to track sharks in Mexico a couple of years ago. You know, engineers. So all aspects of what you might be interested in could contribute to shark research and, to, and, and conservation. Um, don't I, I've worked with artists who have drawn sharks to to educate people, you know, and right. I've got a, you know, a. a, a 15 foot white shark on my wall in my office, you know, that is massive and beautiful done by an artist, you know, so, right. you know, art and science are so closely paralleled and sometimes overlap amazingly. So I, I guess the, I guess the, the, it's a very long answer to a question that I probably didn't even provide a very good answer to, but it's just, you know, working with different people in different fields to try to advance the science would be what I would try to, what I'm, I'm always trying to do. So if you give me more money to do that, I'll keep doing it. You're, I'll, I'll, I'll fill out your blank check and write it, write it to you and send it to you right away. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, I think did. that's going to call the museum tomorrow and look yeah. at where that check is. <laughs> I get you in trouble. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's a fantastic answer. I mean, I'm always talking to, I, I run a, uh, an internship program for high school students here at the museum. And one of the things I'm constantly telling them is that if you're interested in something, you, you can do it, right? You can, we, we harp on sustainability and resilience, um, but this, this applies as well. So if you're a computer engineer, if you're a computer programmer, you could have a home in white shark research, right? And how cool is that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, absolutely. so I, I, you know, I write computer program for for acoustic tags or for um, you know three D <laughs> telemetry tags. So I think that's uh, a fantastic answer, and I think that's that's I, I wish we we had more scientists like that that would that's actively seek out the uh, the technology and collaboration and advancing this thing. That's that's really great. We have, we have one more question from a from an audience member. So do you collaborate or are there uh, exchange of data with other researchers in Cape Cod? Are there, are there other white shark researchers doing similar work or? Yeah, know? one of the things that we've done um, in the last two years um, is we formed this New England White Shark Research Consortium. And what that involves is state agencies, um, academia, private institutions, and uh, nonprofits. And there's at least, uh, I guess, 15 to 20 organizations involved in this, where we all exchange information and hardware, software, you name it, um, mm -hmm. and strategize on the best way to take a regional approach to studying the white shark when it comes into Northeastern areas. Um, the white shark, danger from white sharks is highest off the coast of the northeastern U.S. and Canada. And when the sharks move south, they shift in their foraging strategy and they're not feeding on swimming beaches, right? Mm -hmm. This is where they're doing that. So forming this consortium and sharing data in real time um, is, has become a very, very important aspect of it. So 
from the Canadians all the way down to researchers in Rhode Island, um, we are sharing and working with each other. You know, it's not one group, it's multiple groups. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and even looking at like the social science aspect as well, and we know where the sharks are, where are the people, right? Um, mm -hmm. That might be an interesting kind of thing to see how much overlay there actually is. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so we'll end with a, one last question, just in general, like, so if, if a general, someone from the general public, um, what would be one or two things, what would be like the topic of your list that they could do to help white shark research conservation or just sharks in general? What would be like your top, top two things that they could take action on if they're not in Cape Cod, if they're here in Florida or, other, uh, or elsewhere in the world? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, it, it starts with big picture stuff. You know, uh, you mentioned plastics, right? You know, there are things we can do every day that'll minimize uh, the extent to which we pollute the ocean. Uh, and it's, it, it, we do quite a bit of that. Um, and that impacts everything from plankton up to the top of predators, including sharks. So that, you know, that's, those are everyday activities to, 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 to minimize your carbon footprint and uh, reduce your use of plastics and reduce your waste. Um, that's, that's important. Um, you know, specific to sharks, I'm always telling folks, you know, Hollywood loves to exploit sharks. And, and a lot of people love to exploit sharks to scare people. You know, if you can become a vector for sound, you know, science and good information regarding sharks and the importance of sharks to our marine ecosystem and the truth about sharks and minimizing the myths and, um, and, and the way I, I'm still approached every day by folks who are scared to death of sharks. And, and the truth is, um, every day, and they get in their car every day, and they drive all over the place, and and they all know somebody that uh, has been hurt or killed in a car, but they still do that. Um, you know, the realities of shark attack are are, are 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 really important to express to people, and the realities of sharks and the coolness of sharks. You know, if everyone out there who's paying attention to me, you know, can take what they've learned about sharks and just share that with one other person, then that that propagates this. It, minim it minimizes the, the characterization of sharks as demons, which every newspaper, magazine, and television show and Hollywood likes to do, because it, let's face it, sharks make them money, you know, and the more you could scare people, the more money you make. And that's kind of the world we live in, unfortunately, these days. And so, you know, having the truth out there and everybody who's paying attention, being the vector for that truth is, is important to me. That's a great answer. I, th I think, <laughs> speak the truth, right? <laughs> I think that's a fantastic message to, to send um, is don't, don't exaggerate. Don't, you know, sharks are amazing animals. And um, yeah, we should, we should think more about conserving and, and not being so afraid of them when we don't really need to be, right? So that's right. Well, Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. We, uh, I have enjoyed this conversation. I know our, our guests have as well. Um, and uh, we would love to we'll follow up and um, we'll send links out to your, to all your resources. That'd be great. And um, yeah, thank you very, very much for joining us. So I'm going to share my screen here and show you um, next month. So next month we have um, our speaker on May 5th, uh, again, from 6 to 7 p.m. ish, right? Um, and it's all about shark survival from the shore. We're gonna be joined by Jill Brooks and Hannah Med. They're also um, Save Our Seas Foundation um, researchers and they are researching uh, hammerhead sharks and how they've been affected by recreational fishing here in Florida. Um, so it'll be a, a really nice conversation um, talking about uh, hammerhead sharks, another very charismatic uh, ocean goer. Um, and we would love to see you there. If you'd like to register, mods.org 2022 Save Our Seas, right? Um, and if you want further information about anything that we are doing, you can please uh, go to saveourseas.com 
They have a, lots and lots of amazing information. You can read more about Dr. Skomel's uh, project there, read more about his bio as well, um, and visit mods.org and stay up to date with all the things that we are doing here at the um, uh, Museum of Discovery and Science. So thank you all very, very much for joining us today. Again, thank you, Dr. Skomel. Uh, we really appreciate your participation today. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you.